Let me introduce you to architect Ravindra Kumar. He is a principal architect and one of the founders of the Architect Studio Prague Group. He is also the director of the design studio Venkatarama Associates, in which has offices in three major cities in India. He has been a visiting faculty member at various departments of architecture and has keen interest in secondary education and is the president of TBS Foundation, a school for 400 rural children, and Rankalonga, a not for profit organization. He has lectured as an invitee in many of the events in India and overseas. And he has done extensive documentation on vernacular India for various work groups, including Intac and Madras Craft Foundation. He has lectured in various cities in India and around the world, sharing his experience and ideation of architecture. So we welcome you to the talk sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can I share the screen? Uh, sure, sir. Yeah. So, uh, you know, to, uh, look at uh, uh, content of the presentation to streamline between uh, opinions and what we uh, grade as perception. Um, for an architect, it's very important that uh, uh, we have to bring in a certain uh, quantum of character. We have to bring in a certain uh, opinion, which is focused with training, experience, uh, learning, you know, intense reading and having worked with people and be able to articulate what we want to build and present and walk through that whole imagination. Uh, when you look at different forms of art, uh, what we read uh, is that the stopgap between your creative impetus to what you produce is short-lived as a, compared to architecture. Sometimes uh, what you imagine on a certain specific day and you have a eureka moment and realize that that is spectacular to build takes probably seven or eight years or 10 years to complete. And you have to hold that optimism through the journey of building to be able to capture what you can do. Um, so in, in a quantum leap, when you look at uh, uh, the factor of architecture. It's not only about what a person visually experiences of what you build, but also about how you weave that imagination accurately to a place because you have a context, you have a community, you have a culture, you have people living in it, you have uh, a whole environment that you have to include. It's just not about creating a signature. So therefore, perception and placemaking becomes phenomenal, especially in the tropical world. If you're building in a no man's space like uh, Las Vegas or Dubai, you know, you're just building an iconic monster. So that's a very different direction of making buildings. But when you build in socially uh, controlled uh, context, it's very important that we must understand the nature of discussion. So these diagrams uh, give a, you know, uh, a representation of that connect between the human nature, what is perceived, to what an object is. Um, and for me, I think the most important skill in architecture is to grab or capture is to learn to draw. Uh, you know, how much ever technology can support, there might be other methods to visualize abilities to, uh, to imagine and create. Uh, but I, you might be an artist who does watercolors, or you might be an artist who uses oil and pen or pencil, but it's very important to be able to draw the language. If you, if you meet a, a wildness, you know, he might have learned four or five lessons. And if he starts, if he's able to hold the violin and bring in a sound, it doesn't become music. You know, it doesn't become, you know, he might be able to just twine the strings and create noise. Um, and call it jazz or, or call it his own idea of music, but that is still noise. 
that would be on intensive practice and accurate sort of resurgence of that method of communication through that string instrument you bring melody so same in similar matrix for us as architects we have to get the craft of building right uh, to its last detail and we have to become prolific of that ability to draw and i think that's very very important and uh, uh, so when we look at some examples i thought i'd walk you through a few project programs and 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 explain this idea of perception and connect to composition this is where i'm right now sitting this is our office building uh, when we picked up two properties uh, built before independence and primarily built out of lime mortar lime and mud and sand is primarily the same components that you find in cement you know when you manufacture cement you actually use the same elements but the only difference is before independence how india used to build traditionally through the colonial times was make cement literally a slate lime at site and build up the structures so the most of these buildings were primarily components of similar nature in slate lime so we decided not to demolish the building and convert one bay of it into a kind of a product store and the other one into a reception center and a materials lab and the rest of it since the building did not have too much foundation we built a very light structure still we built managed to build five floors on top of an existing building completely out of uh, reengineered timber and steel recycled steel with the third grade and created a very simple composition which captures the nature of the tree crop around the property and when you look at the section the whole space is articulated in such a way that you could um, you know talk or connect between the studios people could easily communicate i have an office where anyone can walk in and uh, they can hear me if i talk loud in the next level below it's not a closed cabin a very democratic kind of a space as a section and visually it has a huge terrace which takes the spread of the tree on the terrace line and access and extends to large conference centers and the building on the internal aspect we wanted to kind of build a dichotomous or a or a conversation which is in opposition to conventional methods of building so we built a very lightweight structure but it was a large space frame and on top of that we put heavy precast slabs to create an amphitheater on the roof now these are again conversations that we were trying to make within that building and to keep it so subtle when i talk about the nature of its expression to the street we didn't want it to be loud we didn't want it to sort of scream attention for the passer by all materials as architect we wanted to program in such a way that we would uh, give a, a client an experience of what can be recycled what can be reused what can be reduced used um and how can be environmentally super conscious in, in in the methods in which we would articulate and build in any space so all these mattered for us in terms of how we create the compositions uh, we also use some pretty old doors as part of the access points to bring that connect to culture and tradition light was very very important in the way we articulated the workspace areas and composition you know i think very important that we have to draw figure ground we have to draw fenestrations to solid wall ratios and there is a certain amount of analysis that has to be done diagrammatically to recognize its quality before we say that this composition looks good and the only way to look at it is to draw them and look at them and then you will realize that you like one but then when you redraw you will realize that maybe that would be better or the one you previously drew is better but unless you draw you will not realize that answer of its accuracy so it's very important to get into the habit of wanting to draw what you want to build it's very very important rather than you know sort of quickly harness time to run around and turn the way spaces are made uh, we used extensive amount of glass only where the tree shade was maximized so therefore there was no heat ingress but we could manage to bring in a huge amount of daylight and that's the tree capture that we got and the office is extremely transparent to the outside and makes the building look very light even in the night we managed to get a large amount of the ground we didn't want to occupy any more plinth on the ground so whatever was there is open space is courtyard we managed to retain that open space and grab that back as a sort of an air space or a light space um when you look at the rest of the space even the 
the lifts that we have is recycled. It was a lift which was in use for 15 years, so we managed to recable them and uh, replug them into uh, uh, you know working uh, environments. Even the stairways are transparent. You can see how through a staircase you can see the tree crop beyond through the glass. So it was important to sort of hold the whole landscape and the capture of timber to uh, natural materials together in an open space environment and to manage to create what we wanted to do in our workspace environments. So these are some of the visual connects of the workspace areas within is the large courtyard, which uh, all the rooms and the offices, uh, workstations look into. So this brings in a lot of natural light. This is the tree crop and the terrace deck that we have as an outdoor space. Uh, old red oxide floors were retained and we very minimally punched on top. And what is fascinating was we didn't also waste a lot of, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, debris or muck onto the site. So there was nothing that was wasted and used as debris filled to some other sites. So everything was reused. So there was absolutely no excavation done. So these kind of projects bring in a lot of excitement because environmentally, it's super accurate. You know, you don't build any debris out of the site. You don't have any muck to chuck to another sort of, backfill location, all the timber is harvested wood or fallen trees or recycled kind of materials. Now, jumping out of the office space environment to a school, a project which we built in the outskirts of Bangalore, as to how you can extend such an idea even to a small, this was an art village extension for the J. Krishnamurthy Valley School Foundation. We again brought in very old windows and used annotations of the vernacular India as construction ideas. You know, if you have a deep sill and a deep lintel in natural stone, how can you articulate that to make uh, that window vernacular, but at the same time, its constructivist ideas are accurate and is also cost intelligent. You know, large window spaces looking out onto the outdoor to the tree crop, you know, simple materials which where we use stone and bricks which were available from local uh, supplies in close proximity and built a very, very subtle gathering space potential um, uh, as an extension. And what is nice about these materials is that when they all dilapidate, let's say the building survives for another 50 years, and if it falls back, it goes back and becomes earth without having to create you know, non-biodegradable debris. I think that is the joy of natural materials. You can harness any amount of earth. These are again bricks which are sun dried. If you use these kind of bricks, stone which can be reused, you know, the roof uh, steel material is third grade of recycle. The terracotta tiles, though it is, you know, fire burnt, um, uh, you know, or kiln dried, uh, they, when they dilapidate, they become earth again. So every material here is very important to recognize that genre of connect to landscape because what happens to it eventually is joy to earth uh, when it doesn't survive. Uh, jumping out of that, we built a small uh, boutique kind of a hotel, which is like an eight room space with a common living and a common diner kind of a space where people can come over the weekend, stay for long stays um, and also become, get to know each other and that sort of a kind of a hotel a new concept of a hotel, which is unconventional. And when we started visualizing this building, which was almost on top of a mountain, and it has this huge wind gust of two and a half kPa wind load, um, what was fascinating is to uh, create a building, which is like a space frame. You know, when you look at large um, amphitheaters or auditoriums or uh, stadiums, you tend to look at a grid of steel and they form a framework and that grid of steel can span spectacular spans, uh, uh, you know, in terms of horizontal and the uh, uh, longitudinal uh, lens, and they are very minimal in terms of the quantum of steel, just because of the nature of the space grid. So using similar steel technology, we brought back into carpentry. We built the structure all in timber, but recognized the building as a space frame, as though people would live in a framework of a structure. Imagine you have a large you know, space frame, which is spanning three and a half meters by three and a half meters is a minimal grid. A room can be built within that kind of a roof element. So the structure became extremely stable and was built on top of the mound, uh, taking a 2.5 kPa wind load. 
The sloping roof was also done to take the sway of the wind so that it doesn't lift the roof up. You know, a lot of aerodynamic and Katia kind of software, Rhino kind of software was used to model this particular structure uh, to also analyze the nature of wind in this particular hill town and make it accurate. Um, the insides all are timbered. What you see here, everything is built out of timber and carpentry. There's no adhesive, there's no resin, there's no nails, and there is no steel, there's no cement. Uh, so the complete structure is built out of timber. This is in Kurk, similar kind of weather climate that you find in Kerala, in some of the mountain kind of scape. And what you see is wall spaces, all gypsum panels on again made of, of uh, fly ash content. And uh, these are the bedrooms. There are deep layers all around. Sends into landscape. Uh, even when you look at, uh, you know, this is the common sort of reading lounge and the diner uh, where the eight rooms are shared. And this is the extension of the rooms. All the windows open out to the veranda. And there's a huge green bush, which is primarily, uh, uh, you know, a kind of a lime based plant, which does allow snakes to enter or creepy crawlies to enter. Even the toilets, you know, when you sit on the potty, you are able to look at the landscape completely beyond when you're in the shower, you can open off the glass panels and then uh, look at nature and uh, be in the shower cubicle. So these kind of very open environments encourages a connect to landscape, a connect to the outdoor. Um, uh, in a similar region, when we built, you know, almost uh, this was built two, two years back. And when we built Marianda, it was almost 10 years back when we had started working on a an architecture of, of timber, which again uh, is lofted 60 feet above ground as a pavilion. And that pavilion looks towards the crop of the tree. It's almost like a tree house, but it's elevated on solid wood. These are special timber, which we bring uh, uh, from harvested, you know, plantations. These are not uh, trees which are cut from the forest. Uh, uh, people grow uh, large quantums of plantation, even us, as Pra Group architects, we, we, we harvest huge volumes of timber to the tune of almost 70 to 80 acres of land. And our intention is before I leave the planet, I want to make sure that I grow three times the quantum of timber that I have used in my practice. So I'll be fair with Lord when I have a conversation and say that I'm not pinched back the trees out of the crop of earth. But in this quantum, the kind of timber that you can do again is spectacular. People have built uh, historically, uh, using all quantums of timber in terms of architecture, and you can create spectacular volumes. An extension of that idea was another resort which we built in Kerala, uh, the, the Cardamom Club in Thakadi, which is again eight pavilions, completely transparent, uh, all in timber, again elevated above the ground. You can see the level of the balcony and the tree outside, so that gives you a connect as to what uh, elevation it hosts. Each pavilion is at a different level. When you look at the next uh, cluster, it is almost four and a half meters below, and this is the balcony deck of the room. So it is spectacular to get these kind of views and connect to the landscape and keep it very tropical and open. If you notice, the buildings here are not super iconic. You know, they are very, very subtle. The geometries of that are not acrobatic. You know, you don't have to do circus. Sometimes most architects get fascinated by their own conversation and introspection into a geometry and they experiment at the cost of the client to create something which is totally abnormal. And uh, I have nothing against it, but sometimes such a nature of an acrobatic idea does not really become pleasing, you know, to the nature and I. Uh, you must read uh, Aldo Van Eyck uh, or you must read uh, uh, Kenneth Frampton's article uh, by Christopher Alexander uh, in his assembly called, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, critique to the modern history, where you will recognize as to why placemaking and the perception of the human occupation is very important. You ask a little child to draw a house. It's a simple box with a triangular roof. It's not a lopsided, complex-looking composition as Frank Gehry would build. Uh, some compositions as art installations are spectacular. The quantity of detail that are involved is spectacular, but we must recognize what is the footprint that we will eventually capture 
uh, in making these kind of architecture uh, labyrinth the planet. Uh, growing beyond that, our uh, success and uh, conversations with uh, conservation is very, very significant. This is a hotel which we built in Mysore, uh, which was a completely dilapidated structure falling apart. Uh, it's called the Metropole and the government of India, in fact, appointed us uh, to first evaluate whether the structure can be retained. And most of the CPWD engineers declared the building is dead and that it must be demolished and they wanted us to build a new hotel. But we managed to resurrect the old building, do extensions and complete the whole landscape and the architecture of the rooms and the spaces in such a way that, you know, the hotel now grades as one of the best heritage hotels in Southeast Asia. And it has a great quantity of historicity and connect to landscape. Uh, when we look at some of the buildings that we did out of Indonesia, um, you know, we used to collaborate for many years with Made Vijaya. He was an expert gardener and we helped him build the architecture around it, but more focused as pavilions rather than architectural, you know, landmarks or elements. So these were very, very subtle. This is the extension that we did for the Hyatt where you literally don't see the structure. You know, you just see only a landscape and you see a, an eight feet or a two and a half meter eaves line where people uh, move in and out and the rest of it is just again green thatch or gray thatch that sort of surfaces as a structure. So the building is non-existent and what you only see is habituation and the insights of the spaces, how you articulate the furniture, the fabric and the making of the interior spaces because what you see as exterior architecture is just that seven or eight feet space of eaves line and the roof capture. For many years, this was also my home. When I used to go visit Ubud, I used to live here almost every month uh, for less than a week. And the captures of landscape and the amount of outdoors that you can enjoy is spectacular. When we extend a similar kind of an idea uh, to a landscape space, a restaurant in, in North Bangalore, we could manage to capture similar quantum of landscape with the natural sort of uh, exteriors used all furniture, grill works and columns which were recycled, which came from other sites, abandoned and completed a whole restaurant, which became uh, a spectacular deed. Uh, when Taj looked at what we did for Karavali, they invited us to do the extension of the West End uh, Pool Bay area. Again, it became a landscape sort of labyrinth, old buildings resurrected back into glory. You know, the, the, if you can see the nature of furniture, the nature uh, of the cutlery and the arrangements that was done on its perimeter is super accurate, modern, the only necessity to bring in a new lifestyle or the extension to the Paradise Island now, which is blue ginger, completely tropical, modern in its nature and its making of the interiors and the landscape. The perimeters of Bakel that was done as extensions as landscape, all these little elements that we added to make the architecture from growing from banality to making it more rooted to tradition and idea of the local context became significantly important. We were invited many years back uh, to redo the whole uh, architecture of the restaurant space and outdoors and the interiors of the rooms for uh, Jamaica Inn. This is in Jamaica in the Caribbean. Uh, when we did the extensions of the room, we used a lot of local fabric, old furniture, but the materials of the flooring and the nature of hardware, the nature of lighting systems, the wall spaces were extremely modern. And you don't have to do something uh, spectacularly iconic here because the nature and the outdoors and the ocean is so beautiful. You don't have to unnecessarily distract the attention of that connect. All fabric was linen from India and from Caribbean. And it became a spectacular experience to complete that nature of connect to the outdoor and the nature of weaves and the kind of carpentry that was introduced. Now, in contrast to that, when you build in a very intense urban sort of historic, you know, district as in Bangalore North, uh, we built the gateway uh, uh, campus, which is a 36 acre mixed use building. And within that, the buildings were made for dot-com busters. All computer engineers would come and occupy these kind of spaces. A hotel was done where we did the architecture of the hotel for Sheraton and the terrace bar still breathes that idea of the tropicalness 
the uh, articulation of the room interiors uh, was done with all fabrics and stories coming out of India and the waterscape and the landscape. So it does not have to mean uh, that modernity or a nature of a brief that requ requires an aspirational connect to create um, a very IT historic kind of a destination does not have to necessarily connect back with nature and color. <coughs> it doesn't have to be uh, a site always as spectacular as this in Bali. There are large villa tell, which is again a hotel kind of an area, a conference center and outdoor kind of gathering space was built uh, to create the nature of a similar activity as a hotel. Uh, many years back, almost as way back as 97, 98, we started building bin flowers for a client in Mysore. Um, when we started, this was the first bin flower and he went on to build 12 more. He changed his occupation by the nature of this resort that we managed to do. Uh, he would never th think that his revenues would jump up to such a scale, but we engineered a whole experience of a room to be like that, what a king would live, you know, as what it was in Mysore and made a great pavilion room Everything was built out of arak nut, you know, the, uh, the betel nut uh, tree that you get when it gets diseased, the bark becomes very hard and it's spectacular because termites don't eat it. And, but you can create a pavilion out of that. And these are the individual rooms where there is a G plus one room and whole open ground, which used to be a truck parking area, we converted into a waterscape. And this is the green water, which comes from most of the toilets and the waste uh, disposals recycled, re-engineered and put back as aeration tanks. And people will never realize that they're going to sit and look at a pond as part of the visual connect is what water they have actually used and is recycled and is creating as a large aeration pond right in the hub of all the room clusters. And uh, uh, this is the possibility of how you can actually recreate and, and reuse materials to create an ambience. As quite recent to this, we, uh, we built a very large uh, uh, a public space campus, which is a, uh, an old uh, club, uh, it's members only kind of a club, which was the Bowring Institute. Um, and the building again was dilapidated, falling apart. So we took two and a half years to conserve that building. And we completed just the phase one part of the architecture on its surrounds, which becomes a huge uh, uh, sh uh, show kitchen plus a dining area and an extension for the cigar lounge, library, presidential lounge. Uh, a common shared spaces and lounge spaces. Now, this was all what was done as presentation. And when I quickly, if I share with you um, uh, the, uh, the, the images of what recently was completed as architecture, you'll be uh, uh, kind of surprised to see the nature of that connect. This is the old building. And these are all very simple photographs shot by my office team. Uh, not a spectacular camera, but just gives a representation of the club and how it is now. It was totally fallen apart. Uh, we re-engineered the whole of exteriors. We added a huge 25,000 square feet uh, show pavilion where people can see actually food being prepared before they grab their plates. And also they can sit in these large timber verandas and so that it complements the existing buildings in a very subtle, simple way. Uh, this is the large uh, lounge bar reading uh, library uh, with carols. Though material is all timber, every element of furniture is extremely articulated to modernity and the needs of the uh, new sort of social occupation. Um, we included many uh, spectacular designers from uh, Italy, from Barcelona and worked with them to understand the engineering process of how to make furniture on our design. So we used them not as designers, but as critiques to work on our diagrams and our uh, drafted ideas of the furniture needs and converted that into a spectacular outdoor open guard area for landscape. Now this is what is already functional and it's open for people to use and it's again a spectacular experience. This is the jump that you see from where it was to what it is today um, in terms of the club experience. These are all the future phases that will be completed and activated. Um, another extension of conservation work that we did is the National Gallery of Modern Art, extension of the large art space for the government of India that was done uh, uh, around 
eight years back, again a building which was dilapidated, 120 year old mansion that was converted into a permanent gallery. New galleries were built annexed to that in reciprocation to make conversations. This is the modern art gallery that has almost a lakh and 20,000 square feet of an extension. This is the old gallery in the existing building, uh, which used the permanent connections. And you can see the nature of uh, architecture and articulation is pretty contrasting, but at the same time, not screaming its head off and being very experiential in terms of the walk and the nature of its assistance to an existing building. When you talk about innovation, when you want to do something extraordinary in a space which is controlled and, and closed out, uh, what, can it, what can we do to make that nature look natural, <coughs> to make that space uh, not look plastic? You don't have to make PVC laminates on tables. You can use natural wood. You can bring, you know, uh, even a workstation can be more uh, in natural materials. The floor carpets are woven out of, you know, uh, uh, cotton fabrics. And how you can create extensions of such workspaces and environment with green uh, uh, ideas to extend into even a small even a space as, work, as workspace area, which is not more than uh, 1,800 square feet. It doesn't matter the scale of the project or the scale of the building. It matters in terms of the quality of opinion and composition that we eventually capture. A theater that we built in North Bangalore for a 250 capacity with a restaurant and a cafe as an extension on the perimeter is again uh, built out of natural materials. Uh, it's a large, you know, deep thrust theater. Uh, many, many of Nasruddin Shah's plays have been uh, presented here as monologues. Uh, you know, recently before the pandemic, we also had uh, the Tabla Maestro, uh, you know, come and play here uh, with, uh, in a non-acoustic space. That means to say there was no mics, there was no artificial uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 elements used to accentuate noise or sound. Uh, and it's, it works very well because technology wise, it's one of the most accurately designed acoustic theaters as potential. This is the extension of the restaurant, which is called as Fat Ship. Uh, coming out of all that, this is another building that I did many years back, uh, two and a half years back in Pune, uh, which is a large uh, innovation center. Now, uh, Bajaj is manufacturing new age autos, which will be all electric. They want to make cars, which is all electric. So they're working with a collaboration and they have a 10 year uh, period to create one of the most spectacular vehicles that India will be proud of. They do not want to release the vehicle in uh, till the eighth year. And uh, this is an existing building where actually the client asked me, it was a factory and he asked me whether we should demolish the whole factory and build a new factory because he wanted to make it iconic. He wanted to see a, an idea which would be uh, uh, prolific to the experience of building a new age car, which is third world, the, the new world car. Uh, in the from the third world. So when we uh, started looking at the building and the space, we said we don't have to really demolish the building. We reuse the north light. We reuse the nature of its whole arena and created uh, a kind of an anaconda, kind of a continuous element with green, which became like a very very sculptural addition to a whole environment of this. Uh, technology built space. So what you see there as those polyhedral elements are actually cabins uh, for vice presidents and uh, innovation scientists from automobile industry to sit and work within this environment. And you can see these workstations, these are lounge, common meeting room spaces, and you have a huge volume of a factory with not lights acting as a basic support. <coughs> the whole floor has radiant cooling where the air conditioning is done, like your refrigerators, uh, you know, is done from the floor by making the whole floor reduced by, you know, almost 11 to 12 degree temperature to the nature of heat on the outside. And you pump fresh air into the whole workspace environment. You don't need to have any large air handling units. And the, the building and the nature of it is very, very um, um, new age, sort of space age kind of composition also to be inspirational to the nature of architecture and the people who habituate this building to be innovative. Yeah. It's not about wanting to grow a new plant. It's not about wanting to create a green idea. It's about making new age cars, new age 
uh, environmentally accurate cars, which brings a lot of sunlight into its use, this is the auditorium that is annexed to that. Um, adding to all this, what we see as a spectacular field is an extension of a large campus for Cummins. Uh, now, this building is actually uh, uh, listed also in uh, the Guinness Book of World Record for the largest uh, secondary walling system. This is the Cummins Technology Center uh, or the India Technology Center, as they call it, uh, in Pune. The system of glazing is very, very unique. We worked with Innovation Glass, a spectacular glass age company coming from the United States where, uh, you know, conventionally you will always see an aluminum frame bolted onto a concrete beam or a wall. And then there's a glass that is clipped on. Here it's the reverse cycle. You actually clip the glass onto the edge lines of the slab and you put elements of aluminum like columns on the exterior and pin the glass to the internal wall perimeter. It's a very different method of looking at technology. And you have a secondary wall, a double wall system where you have complete greenery capturing uh, the threshold of the inside window to the outside window. It sits in a wooded landscape. We did not cut any tree, even if it is iconic. The nature in which it uh, refracts light and reciprocates to landscape becomes a spectacular deed. This is a technology center. There are 60 test cells. You know, India is, is super able in terms of technology and they actually, you know, you find locomotive engines for example, for trains or aircrafts done by Cummins. Cummins manufactures these engines for a Boeing aircraft. So these engines go through a 1 million cycle in, in a huge amount of heat, temperatures, wind uh, speeds, and cold temperatures. And they run these engines to see its performance in extreme weather conditions. So they are called this test cell laboratory. Each test cell is around 9 meters uh, in terms of width, and the depth is... Uh, around uh, 21 meters, the height is around 21 meters. So they put these engines into these kind of spaces and test them before they are uh, mounted on actual locomotives or aircrafts. So it became a technology site, like a laboratory, a physics and chemistry laboratory for all this work to happen. And when we built this whole architecture, the notion and the nuances of that experience had to be to connect back to both the sensitivity of the mind to nature and to the way landscape reacts to a workspace environment, to be subtle in grading of the interior, but be spectacular on the nature of its exterior and erections. Now, um, when we did their corporate office for the same company in the same city, they were uh, fascinated by the architecture that we did. Then they invited us to do their corporate office, which was a large terrace. Uh, we requested the developer to give us one standalone towers, but eventually he gave all the three towers as their corporate office. We created a huge quantum of horizontal landscape. We worked with Bill Bensley uh, for the landscape ar architecture. There was a large conference center, uh, you know, banquet halls that was done as extensions. But again, we used the word uh, elements of parametric. We used uh, uh, softwares like Rhino, uh, advanced uh, 3ds Max studios to create these kind of nature of complex geometries of curves that you see of these buildings to capture the whole nature of acoustics and the interiors and make the architecture very, very experiential. I will not call it iconic or it's not to make anything look weird or make a person suddenly feel that he's not seen it at all before. That is not the point of intention. It has to be experiential. When you enter a church or a mosque or a temple, what is nice is that experience that you gather right from the time, time you park your vehicle somewhere on the exteriors and walk through that whole passage space to go to the name. Uh, there is a whole position of that experience that grabs your reverence and makes you spiritually more inclined or focused. Uh, that becomes a haptic experience. So I think architecture has to be experiential, should become timeless to create that nature. Uh, another laboratory space that we did with, within nature was uh, definitely one of my most successful experiments. So we took up a challenge to build a complete glass pavilion, you know, for a three floor space and create a wooded garden. So I presented a challenge to the client to spend a lot of money on landscape and create a totally transparent pavilion where people would actually sit in these office spaces and workspace areas and actually look at complete intense landscape. 
So it almost makes you feel <coughs> part of an outdoor arena as nature to connect to the workspace environment, bring in a lot of daylight uh, during the winter and the monsoon times, but made iconic elements within the architecture. The stairways became spectacular. For example, there were six structural engineers who worked with me to get this stairs accurate. This is an 18 meter cantilever into a large uh, uh, volume. You know, it was a simple thing like a scissor. If you hold the scissor from the blade edge line and open it, and the whole staircase was designed with such an idea uh, to articulate the capture of the ground. And the client was so impressed that he said, the architecture, Ravi, is so accurate that we don't even need art in the space. We don't need to put any sculptures or artifacts to embellish or to sort of make this accessorize the place. It's very quiet, it's very modern, it's all very intense laboratories and offices to intense uh, pharmaceutical laboratories as extensions. And in these kind of intense workspaces, the scientists or the uh, theoreticians are always in landscape, always in the outdoor arena, always connected to landscape in a spectacular way. A project such as Nirlon Knowledge Park, this is a, a 24 or a 25 acre uh, landscape where we used a huge amount of real estate uh, facilitation to this particular project. It's almost five in FSI. This is in heart of Mumbai. Um, and we decided to tell the client, this project I started in 2002, and I'm still building the last phase. Uh, maybe there will be another phase still. So the client continued to work with us for more than 18 years. And everything as exterior, as everything as secondary wall, uh, I would bring the attention of all the students to recognize the word secondary walling system and analyze and study that in better because the new world will experience a lot of such architecture using the secondary walling system. So the way we did this project was to create a huge linear lake, which is primarily again from all the water that comes out of this um, office spaces and the occupants, which has almost 56,000 people working in this campus. Whatever water they use comes back to aeration and forms a huge water body. These are the reception centers. And you can see this water body is actually an aeration tank coming out of all the toilets and wastewater outlets and the pantries and the restaurants and the landscape, um, you know, uh, extra water that sort of overflows as weep uh, coming into this pond, getting recycled, and uh, it gets filtered perfectly well and is put back into reuse within the building. And what you see as a nature of landscape, there are four levels of basement below. You can still grow the kind of landscape that you want to grow over above and the terracotta was a common language that we use up to six to seven floors of the building where when people start walking, they experience more of the terracotta. They see more clay, more natural stones, and they more connect with the landscape and the material on its perimeter. Uh, extensions to similar nature was built for again, Cummins in another collaborative space environment as office area where a building is absolutely iconic in its nature of composition and the architecture here, you are building definitely a sculptural model for building, become experiential for the people who be within. A project that we did for uh, IIT Technologies in Rurki, uh, very simple materials of plaster and kota. There are only two materials in the whole facility, which is kota stone and plastered surfaces of concrete <coughs> and white element, which became again a campus treat for an academic kind of a curriculum and an extension of that experience. Sometimes when you build campuses for technology elements, uh, there is also a need as a client who would request for buildings to be a little more celebratory in the nature of their capture to landscape. They want the buildings to be impressive, to bring in international customers to them so that they can create collaborations. So this was a laboratory for uh, HPCL, Hindustan Petroleum uh, uh, Petrochemicals Limited, which is primarily uh, again, a large laboratory and workspace environment where they work on products of petroleum and support lines and do the nature that is done for the requisites of what we do as uh, 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 a Hindustan petroleum uh, product. Uh, when you grow towards a public space, a public arena, a large project that we took a capture was the Church Street in the city center Bangalore, 
um, what was interesting of all this idea was the government of India, uh, the government of Karnataka, Bangalore, we have pre presented a challenge to resurrect the whole old street, which is totally dilapidated in terms of engineering and in terms of its presentation and outlooks as, as what it was as a perimeter. So we not only brought in the concept of aesthetics primarily to bring in color, caliber, it would become a large selfie space. People would want to be there, but also re-engineer the whole services. This was what was there below the street. It was a total mess of services engineering. And this is what we did to those sections. So sometimes architecture is not about aesthetics alone. You cannot garden off a whole idea of engineering to another quarter. The architects must participate <coughs> productively to calibrate the quality of engineering to make these spaces suddenly look like this. This is what was there before, totally dilapidated. And this is what is there. What you do is very subtle. You don't do anything super spectacular to the surfaces. But the nature of its engineering and the nature of services that you find below ground is what is spectacular. This is the project, the first Sheraton that I showed you is part of the 34 acre campus. Again, in a project like this, we, when we requested the developer to build a two and a half acre lake, he was stunned by the idea because the cost of such land is humongous, but he encouraged the whole team to do that, which is again, recycled water coming back for aeration and it holds the World Trade Center as one of the architectural elements and landmarks, the housing complex that captures around it, and the nature of landscape and the perimeter that you see as the labyrinth. What is very, very important in all this is the nature of connect that you create between the inside and outside. When you build in the tropical world, I think that is what is most, most important for us to read uh, as as uh, the haptic experience or the, or the experience of making architecture complete is to make your buildings converse with landscape. I will show you two short, short videos. One uh, is the nature in which you have to draw. This is my own experiment drawing a large master plan landscape. This, uh, you know, capture, I, what, why I want to impress the student community is to see that you have to draw. This takes five hours. It's a five hour video which has been you know, plugged back less than a minute just to show you um, how the nature of that particular land, uh, the, the nature of drawing, the nature of how you must articulate, make compositions when you build and using uh, these techniques of drawing, not necessarily three dimensional drawings, but large master plans and countries when you draw them completely accurately with the ideas in mind, it becomes much, much better. Uh, as the nature in which we would, you know, uh, be able to present uh, uh, content and drive the concept from its original thought process to the individual making of the building complete. A simple example. This is a six-hour exercise that is done with the team and how it comes back as a capture. I leave uh, with you all folks to hear this one video, hopefully it will open up. Um, we don't normally look at light. We're generally looking at something like reveals. For me, it was important that people come to value light. To value light as we value gold, silver, paintings, objects. It's not something that you form with the hands, like wax or clay. You don't carve it away like with wood or stone. You don't assemble it like molding it. And it's kind of learning your craft. Uh, and it took a while for me to make it to work with light so that you really felt its physical presence and came to value it. I started making these kinds of spaces first in my studio, but the idea began to evolve so that I actually was making these spaces outside. You actually entered and then look out from, I suppose to gain outlook or 
even insight on how we perceive sky. This is a space where I want to bring the space of the sky down to the top of the space you're in, so that you really feel to be at the bottom of the ocean of air. And you really then experience this quality that can happen at the change of day to night and night to day. But doing this way at the cusp of change is very important. Thank you. Uh, Ravi sir, can you just play that video on smoke, please? Uh, it was not visible on the screen, I guess. Oh my God, okay. Let me do that. <clears throat> Are you able to see now? We don't normally look at light. Can you see? We're generally looking at something uh, feels. Are you able to see? Uh, no, sir. For me, it was important that people come to value light. Yeah, it's working. Good, good. To value light as we value gold, silver, paintings, objects. It's not something that you form with the hands, like wax or clay, you don't carve it away like with wood or stone. You don't assemble it like molding it. And it's kind of learning your craft and it took a while for me to make it to work with light so that you really felt its physical presence and came to value it. I started making these kinds of spaces first in my studio. The idea began to evolve so that I actually was making these spaces outside. You actually entered to then look out from, I suppose, to gain outlook or even insight on how we perceive sky. This is a space where I want to bring the space of the sky down to the top of the space you're in, so that you really feel to be at the bottom of the ocean of air. And you really then experience this quality that can happen at the change of day to night and night to day. But doing this way at the cusp of change was very important. Uh, what is fascinating actually here is the nature of detail that he did with glass. It's actually a glass covered space. Uh, I've been physically there in that space and the way the detailing is done and the technology used to make sure that the size of the glass panel is accurate, is super clear and the edge details of it to be super accurate that you get, a, get to feel that you're sitting in a closed room but you're able to concentrate and look at the sky and be focused to look at the sky and experience sky and be in a meditative space. He's not an architect but he's an installation artist and what he did manage to create or simple architectural experience to be with nature and the nature in which he connects these experiences with light, I think, which is super fascinating. <coughs> uh, I don't know whether you saw the previous video, uh, the sketching video. Could you see that, uh, Asif? Uh, I don't think so, sir. I'll just play that again. Yeah, great. Uh, I already talked about this whole experience of sketching. It was six hour video, six hours of drawing. Can you see the video? You able to see the video? Yes, yes.
doing your long stretch activity where you actually work with your team, draw um, an accurate kind of a, you know, master plan image line and how that drawing experience will bring you uh, connect to what you want to build. Thank you. Well, that was really wonderful. A diverse palette of experiences and, you know, architecture in different dimensions. I hope the students really had a great exposure of the vivid approaches that could be called architecture and the dimensions from which people actually perceive the same. Hello. Thank you. Uh, the forum is open. Like if the, if the participants can ask queries, uh, they could actually um, and get a sneak peek of you know in, insights or thought perspectives that went behind any of those projects you saw there on screen, or anything you would like to you know ask Revisa regarding his uh, architecture practice spread over decades. Hello, sir. Hi. Hi, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for this wonderful webinar and your projects are very much interesting and it speaks for itself the amount of research which you must have put behind that. And actually, uh, I have been uh, through your talks and all and there was one point which actually caught my interest. It was uh, a talk at I think um, FCDI and in that you said that uh, we should actually celebrate architecture. Uh, so actually I have two questions. Uh, the first one is that today architectural education is very much uh, oriented towards the syllabus and it's kind of restrictive and it's actually imparting a kind of stress in students. So uh, we students, how should we actually uh, celebrate this architecture? What's your perspective on this? See, when you go to a lecture, when you go to a common sort of convention center meeting room, there is a presenter who comes and speaks to you a certain idea or his experience or a knowledge space that he will want to share. At the end of the day, it is for us student community, for us people who want to learn out of that experience and grab what we want. Your syllabus or your college as a campus or the lecturers that you who come and present certain ideas to you create workshops are only fulcrums for you to step up to the destination that you want to. The first five years of your architectural experience, if you spend time with useless morons as friends, you will be living in the pits. Instead, if you focus on reading, on creative reading, and be associated with people who are inclined to academics, who are interested in discussions and forums, who will participate with you not only in spaces of joy, and happiness, but also in spaces of accurate academic sort of verticals. Be associated with your staff and teachers who will only give you clues of new ideas. You will be the maker of your own destiny. There is nobody to reason or nobody to blame or nobody to call them as restricted sort of arenas. It doesn't make one person just because he studied in Harvard or Pratt's becomes a spectacular able person. It only allows him to be able to make the craft of drawing or the craft of the uh, architectural you know, engineering or imagination become better provest. But at the end of the day, trust me, my friend, it is for you to build your psyche. It is for you to build your persona. You know, you have to be the performer. If you want that girl to like you, you have to look handsome. Nobody can tell you how to become handsome. You know, they can give you ideas and possibilities how to look handsome, but you have to be that one person of great character, of great affection, of great caliber of conversation, and of great, you know, presentation skill sets, which makes that other person want you. That's all that makes you fall in love. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. That was really side provoking. And my uh, second question is that, Today, we actually follow a lot of standards, right? Uh, but, you know, in your projects, uh, every time it was very much research oriented. So uh, being architecture students, uh, what is the importance of research in the, in the study field? You're always learning. You're always learning, my friend. There is no point that you stop doing your research. 
standards are always required for us to benchmark references or when you build in a certain city certain country you have to follow some parameters of control which brings about the nature of the quality of architecture that you build um, so it's very important that we have to focus uh, on recognizing standards only to form a sort of a clean slate for you to build off from uh, the rest of it is always research it, it, that's why i showed you a project that we did in rootkey which is simple brick and mortar and plaster and gota stone it doesn't have but it's it's an idea of composition so you don't have to really uh, need an opportunity where the client gives you a free hand the client gives you an opportunity to build everything one act all that is not required you know every project is a super big challenge and how you focus and make sure the strength of it becomes accurate in the way you build becomes spectacular as an experience thank you sir thank you sir for sharing your insights Uh, so good morning, sir. Uh, so, sir, I would like to ask you, like, all your projects, like from uh, the project in Bali to the Rorke project, it's quite drastic change in architecture. How do you incorporate technology as well as um, climate responsive in both kind of architecture? I think that's one of the greatest USPs that clients have always rewarded me of saying I'm being very versatile. They tell me when they look at four of my projects, they sometimes feel that they were done almost by four different architects. I think that is my success story because it's very important to print the nature of architecture to the context, to the client. You know, you have to weave around that space. If you want to build, you know, when we did the two elements that we built in China, in Shanghai, when I built the Sabic facility and I built the GlaxoSmithKline facility in Shanghai, the nature of the park was different, the nature of context and the culture of construct was different. Whereas when you build it in Mysore or when you build it in Kerala or you build it in Kurg, the nature of context and the landscape and the, and the way the mountain and the climate references are different. So it is not about consistency. We are not in the times of brutalism where we master uh, our modernistic kind of ideation towards making one material accurate or the nature of our practice and our style important as an art sort of experience. I think architecture has grown beyond that. That's why I would recommend all of you to read this book by Christopher Alexander called Pattern Language. It's a fantastic Bible where you actually will read why you have to make place, why you have to be contextual and why the nature of your architecture and the nature of your build must be beyond you rather than just be the artist in you. So that's the reason why you see it versatile. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your success mantra. So thank you, Asif. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation opportunity. And I want to uh, wish all the students the very best and wish the institution the super best. You're doing a fantastic job. Um, I think Asif can only be the fulcrum to every individual to be the best that uh, you can be. And the only way you can be is to do the best of your readings. You know, read as much as you can, travel as much as you can, draw as much as you can. And... Uh, Hibernate only around people who bring sense and sensibilities to life. I think that is what is important. All the best. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Asif. Thank you, sir.